Hello everyone, I'm Matt Mallander, Direct Director of Influence Engagement from Cycling UK, uh, the clues on the wall. Um, yeah, welcome to the Bike Week webinar today. Uh, really pleased to have you here and some great panellists to talk about their experiences of encouraging people to, to cycle to work. So today's uh, is a series, is, is part of a series of webinars we've been having all week. Today's is very much about making commuting by bike the first choice for people uh, post lockdown. Uh, but earlier in the week, we had webinars on behaviour change, embedding the new cycling culture we're seeing, uh, and also what uh, local authorities and cities are doing to prepare for people uh, welcoming them onto bikes uh, onto uh, onto the roads after lockdown. And all those videos are available on our website uh, to view. Um, so yeah, today is very much how we can support those businesses to encourage their staff to cycle to work. Uh, I know many of you on the call were already part of that journey and part of that solution. Um, we at Cycling UK are also part of that. We really believe that and part of our strategy is to get a million more people cycling. Uh, and a big part of that is workplaces. Uh, workplaces employ 32 million people uh, across the UK. Uh, and so have a huge part in playing to nudge people into taking up cycling uh, for transport. Um, we think we've got the formula. Uh, we know some of the ingredients and some of our speakers today will testify to their activities. We've got guides which you can download from our website, Cycle Friendly Employer Schemes. Um, we've got a range of services and offers to support you to do that. We've also got a badge, the Cycle Friendly Accreditation Badge, for those businesses who, who want to really show off that they've uh, achieved that. But more of that uh, later. You know, what's the opportunity? Well, most of the UK live within five miles of work. Obviously, there are exceptions. Half the population have access to a bike, uh, yet 16 million of those people choose to, to drive to work um, compared to 1 million people cycling. But yeah, you're part of the converted, so you know that uh, this is a good thing. So our job collectively is to help people do more of that. Um, we all know that commuters face a long time sitting in traffic, congestion, uh, wasting their time, precious money, uh, and cycling is a real uh, option to benefit their own fitness, their well-being, um, their, uh, their, their bottom line, their, their, their financially um, uh, and uh, their time getting to work and for businesses to encourage your workplaces to cycle. Obviously, you've got a fitter, more engaged workplace. You've got a, an audience of employees who um, will appreciate you because you're providing the services that they want. And also you potentially save money through car parking spaces or reduction of those uh, and staff travel. Um, but for most of that, you know, that's that's not new. That's been around for a while, yet those numbers are still lower than we would hope. So, you know, what, what is the COVID situation provided? The, you know, one of the upsides, I know they're not many, um, but one of the upsides is that the government have really kind of woken up to this green transport revolution uh, and they're telling us to cycle to work, uh, for school, to leisure. Uh, so, you know, and they're putting their money where their mouth is with, with money for pop-up cycle infrastructure and support. Um, likewise, you know, we recognise that there is going to be uh, a big impact on public transport on, uh, through social distancing, the ability to be on public transport in close proximity to people is going to reduce. So we're not all going to be able to get on public transport. So there's an onus on us to move around differently. Um, the good thing is that people obviously recognise the benefits. Uh, our own surveys say that of those people that are now cycling, we're seeing double cycling rates. Um, 100% more people commuting for leisure and utility, double wet for, for leisure of the weekend. I'm sure we've all seen families and people cycling and getting bikes out of sheds. As I said, most people have got access to a bike and we're, we've really found it through lockdown. So they themselves, those people that are now cycling, 68% of those people want to carry on cycling post lockdown. Um, the AA uh, did a, a survey of its own drivers. Uh, and 36 of those commuters said that they wouldn't be returning to the cars. They'd be trying to move to cycling and walking with their commute to work. So there's a real appetite from people uh, to do that. So that's the theme. That's the kind of the art of the possible. Um, so I'll give you a, a very quick run. Um, you know, we've got some great speakers today. Um, so I'm going to introduce the speakers and invite them to um, introduce themselves, say a couple of words, and then we'll, um, we'll go into uh, a little bit more of a deep dive with each of them. Uh, individually and then at the end we'll bring them all back for a panel discussion so please uh, do uh, pop some questions in the uh, the question bar uh, and then we can pick those up and, and put them to our panelists later so uh, again thank you for all for joining uh, and thank you to the speakers so uh, in no particular order 
Uh, firstly, welcome uh, Dame Sarah Story, Britain's most successful uh, Paralympian and uh, cycling policy advocate and active travel commissioner for Sheffield. Uh, we've also been joined by Paul uh, Hushoff uh, from Dutch, um, he's a Dutch consultant in getting businesses cycling. Hello, Paul. Um, we've got Jane Cornelius uh, from Swansea University. Uh, hello, Jane. Um, hello. Hello, welcome. And uh, again, we've got Anna Martha Yelving, a uh, transport consultant from Royal Huskoning from the Netherlands as well. Um, so hello, hello everyone. Sarah, do you want to just introduce yourself briefly? Oh, sorry, you're on mute. Yeah. Hi everyone, thank you, Matt. Sorry about being on mute. Um, you'd have thought I was used to it by now. After. <laughs> I think this is day 91 on the work from home house for me. Um, so yeah, I'm Sarah Story. I live on the west side of the Pennines, but I work in Sheffield City Region as the Active Travel Commissioner. I've also um, been working alongside Chris Boardman at British Cycling as the policy advocate. Um, I'm still a competing athlete as well, so I'm uh, negotiating the uh, delayed Paralympic Games, which are going to be uh, next August. Uh, fingers crossed. Great, thank you. Paul? Uh, my name is Paul Hofschild. I work for a small consultancy firm. It's called 3PM and I cycle a lot in the UK, but then on Swift in London. Um, um, and I work from home since the 16th of March. Uh, so three months, more than three months, I think. Yeah. Great. Welcome. Uh, Jane. Hi, I'm Jane Cornelius. I'm the Sustainable Travel Officer for Swansea University. Um, I'm not a massive cyclist. I do not cycle, commute to work by bike. Um, I'm a leisure cyclist, uh, but I am, I've been told I'm an enabler. So I'm going to be looking at today from a different perspective, encouraging and helping those that can cycle to cycle. Great. Thank you, Jane. Uh, and Anna. Yes. Uh, my name is Anna Marta Jelving. Um, I'm a consultant on behavior and mobility at Royal House Koning DHV in the Netherlands. And one of my main focus points is um, behavioral change towards sustainable mobility. And of course, cycling is a large part of that. Um, and of course, we cycle a lot in the Netherlands. I live in Amsterdam and cycling is my main mode of transportation here. Uh, and I try to support others to cycle as much as possible as well. Great, welcome. Um, and also on the line, uh, you can't see her. Uh, unfortunately, the camera's not working, but you'll be able to hear her in a second. Um, we'll be welcoming uh, Brekia. Uh, Shashova, um, the ambassador for the Dutch Embassy. Um, the Dutch Embassy have been a, a proud and uh, supportive partner of Bike Week for many years. Uh, this is a, a very different Bike Week. Uh, normally we'll be having lots of events and getting people out on bikes um, and the Dutch Embassy have been um, kind enough to host our launch every year where we then uh, have a bike breakfast and then we cycle with the MPs through Hyde Park uh, back to Parliament. So uh, it, it wouldn't be my week without Dutch Embassy. So uh, Brekia, welcome. Yes, and thank you, uh, thank you, Matt, for this introduction. And I'm very sorry uh, that you can you cannot see me, but um, uh, my telephone doesn't support uh, uh, this uh, app uh, uh, fully, and uh, my employer, the Netherlands government, doesn't allow me to download it on my PC. Uh, but I'm very happy to to join. Uh, it's very sad not to have the event uh, that you just. Um, um, uh, alluded to Matt, uh, uh, every year uh, we have uh, loads of uh, bikers uh, in the embassy and then outside of the embassy and going to uh, Parliament Square. Uh, although if I'm looking outside now out of my window, it's raining cats and dogs. Um, so that is actually one of the benefits of doing it uh, uh, this, uh, this way. Um, uh, as you know, cycling is of course uh, in our uh, in our genes. It's our second nature, also also for me. And I've been an avid cycler all my life. But also here in London, I use a bike uh, a bike uh, to go uh, to Westminster, for example, for my meetings, um, where it is always very difficult to find a parking place. Um, uh, and in lockdown, I of course enjoyed uh, biking a lot uh, on quiet roads. Now that the traffic is coming back, you realise again. Uh, that um, infrastructure is of main importance and of course in the Netherlands um, we haven't uh, we used to cycle and then for a while we didn't uh, and then we had to invest massively in infrastructure uh, and maybe um, uh, one or two of our panelists will allude to that uh, uh, later on in the discussion. As an employer we, we have always encouraged our employees to come by bike uh, also here in London 
uh, and to make use of the cycle to work scheme we have showers we have parking uh, racks and uh, during the crisis we saw that the interest in the scheme has gone up um, uh, and that is of course something uh, to be welcomed and we actively encourage people to, to do that and we put even also uh, extra, extra bike racks outside and uh, hopefully that will be uh, sustained uh, in, in the future. Um, I'm looking forward to today's webinar. Um, I can see you all, of course, uh, and I'm very happy to work again with Cycling UK uh, and with Dutch Cycling MBC. And um, uh, as North Sea neighbours, of course, we stand ready to share our experience with you. Thank Lovely. you, Matt. Thank you very much. I have an image of you sitting on a bike as we speak. So, uh, um, <laughs> um, right, on, on that, talking about infrastructure and, and the support we're going to give uh, workplaces, I will hand over to Sarah to tell us a bit about you know where she sees us at the moment in, as a cycling nation. Uh, you know what what's the art of the possible now uh, post COVID uh, lockdown and what specifically is happening in in the Sheffield City region. Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, no, at the moment we are working on the emergency active travel funding, um, which was announced on May the 9th. Um, and there's been two tranches of that funding. Um, the first one, the submissions were done on last Friday and the current uh, tranche two submissions are um, being developed at the moment. So in some ways it doesn't feel as emergency as we perhaps would like it. Um, we certainly need to adapt our, our roads uh, and make sure that we can enable more people to stay on their bikes. One of the things that lockdown brought to the country was more people being able to get out and about um, and with an exercise slot being initially one of those four um, things that we were allowed to leave home for here in the UK and um, that meant that people were exploring their local neighbourhoods, they were instantly thrown into low traffic neighbourhoods and um, they were provided with an environment that none of us ever imagined would be able to create um, so perhaps one of the few silver linings of the, the pandemic and the lockdown was that people suddenly experienced a world that previously you know, had never been possible. Uh, and that then in turn threw up other options in, in terms of roads that perhaps could be utilised in different ways that people hadn't ever imagined those roads without cars on them um, and other vehicles. And so all of a sudden everyone looked outside the window and saw a completely different world. Um, we know that bike shops have been um, inundated with people um, coming in for repairs, buying new bikes and most of the bike shops across the UK have reported an inability to sell anyone a bike now that's under £1,000. All the, um, the, you know, the lower option bikes and um, the commuter bikes have all disappeared um, and across the world suppliers are struggling to, to keep up with demand and so we know that there's a huge appetite out there and now we have to make sure that we create the infrastructure that enables those people to keep cycling and also keep walking safely as well so i think um what we're planning to do in the sheffield city region is probably fairly similar to to most of the uh, devolved combined authorities across the uk and certainly one of the government's um plans as well is that for up to two kilometres, it's possible that most people would be able to walk that. And um, for up to five kilometres, it would be perfectly cyclable. And the beauty of cycling is that bikes come in so many different shapes and sizes, um, three wheel bikes, four wheel bikes, cargo bikes. And so for people with mobility challenges, uh, cycling suddenly opens up an opportunity to take short journeys without a vehicle, provided the infrastructure is suitable. Um, and so we constantly have this discussion. And when I was appointed Active Travel Commissioner, because of my history, as a, a para-athlete, a swimmer first and now a cyclist, it's been very close to my heart throughout my life really that we have accessibility for everybody. Um, if you're walking in a wheelchair, if you're using a day chair when, when you go for a walk, that's um, equally as valid a journey as someone who's doing that on two feet. It's absolutely vital that we have um, the dropped curbs, we have the width available and that where we have um, challenges with narrowings on routes, that pretty much makes the whole route completely unusable. So we're working really hard on infrastructure standards. We're also expecting government to produce national infrastructure standards that ensure that everybody can access a network. Um, and obviously at the moment, the funding is uh, prioritized towards cycle routes or active travel lanes. Um, because there are e-scooter trials coming online as well and we we look at the homogene homogeneity of speed when we're deciding where people would be placed um, within 
the, the road space. So we will have people on the pavement walking. Um, we'll have the active travel lanes for those vehicles, people going up to sort of 15 miles an hour. And then in the roadway for the vehicles going 15 to 20 miles an hour or maybe 30 if that's the speed limit there. So there's a whole range of different um, interventions that we have available. And it's about now working with our councils and bringing together the best solution for the region. Um, within Sheffield City Region, we already had a map purposed for people to comment on what they were would like to see, what they'd like to see changed. And we repurposed that map within the, the pandemic so people could give us specific things that were a challenge during lockdown and with social distancing now the norm. And that map has received um, over a thousand comments in the COVID-19 situation and several other places around the UK have also enabled themselves a map to gather comments of people um, so they can pinpoint specifically where those challenges are. And obviously for cyclists, there's still a social distancing element because if you're passing somebody on a pavement, you still want to be able to give them that space. So the width of the um, trial infrastructure lanes that we're putting in across the UK or we'd like to see put in across the UK also need to take that into account as well. So it's a very busy time. I think any active travel team across the UK will tell you that. Um, and we also have to look at the other peripheral things that bring it all together and things like bike parking and security when people arrive at work and also whether or not people are going to uh, need uh, changing rooms and showers uh, and also one of the things that we're looking into that perhaps hasn't been looked into and is often left out is for those people who run to work because uh, a number of people took up running in lockdown uh, and they're also looking at the opportunity of whether their journey, you know, two to five kilometres is a runnable distance as well. So looking at all the active options for people because we know how important that is to keep people healthy, not just from a physical perspective, but also from a mental well-being perspective as well. Great, that sounds like a, a lot going on. So um, not wishing to put you on the spot, uh, but maybe a little bit. Um, What's, uh, what are the timescales of this infrastructure coming online? So the initial uh, tranche of funding is due to be um, announced and uh, in the, the bank accounts, I guess, of the, of the authorities by the first week of July, um, which is probably slightly later than everyone had anticipated and hoped, given the announcement was on May the 9th. So that um, obviously creates challenges. Uh, some authorities are doing things at risk, which also uh, throws up challenges as well. And then the second tranche of funding is expected, um, we think, in August. Um, but that's that's still being, um, you know, ironed out and made a decision on according to how quickly those plans and, and it's split. So the first tranche coming is much smaller. So, for example, in Sheffield City region, our first tranche is about 1.4 million and the second tranche is about 5.6. So we're looking, you know, um, it's very much um, the second tranche where you can um, potentially do the most. Great. And that, the, the 5.6, I'm guessing you've got, as you mentioned, you have a map. Is the 5.6? I mean, it's called temporary measures, but I guess I guess this is this will help fast track some of your existing plans, won't it? Well, we've referred to them as trial measures because there's obviously a revenue and a capital funding split, and with trial measures, they come out of the capital pot. So that allows us to look at the um, the plans we already had. So we uh, last week launched our active travel implementation plan and that was a plan that had been pulled together inside the first 12 months of my appointment and um, the collective efforts of the districts the local authorities with the Sheffield City Region active travel program pulled together how we'd like to see the region look by 2040 so it's a gradual build according to all of the other things that are going on within the region and one of the things that the emergency funding does is it allows us alongside our uh, transforming sitting cities fund money allows us to look at the measures that are going to be most useful um, in the uh, easing of lockdown and in the response to the easing of lockdown and potentially any subsequent local lockdowns or whatever might happen as we move into the autumn and then the winter. Uh, and the other thing that it does is allows us to accelerate parts of that active travel implementation plan that perhaps we didn't ever expect to have the opportunity to do so. Because like I said in the opening remarks, we have seen a, a region, we've seen a UK where you know there was no vehicles on some of the major routes that would normally be um, 
heavily congested and so that allowed us to see things quite differently so accelerating certain routes may be an opportunity subject to where local authorities deem to be um the priority and, and the most chance of of having the, the best number of people on bikes and utilizing those routes great okay um two quick questions and then i will uh move on and then we'll have questions later um I'm guessing um, the map's still online. Is that something that businesses can can now engage with? Yeah, so anyone who lives or works in the Sheffield City region can go to our interactive map. You can access that through the Sheffield City region website. And the blue layer, the blue comments are all the comments that have been put on there since the uh, COVID-19 um, lockdown. And um, those comments are you know, being reviewed weekly by the local authorities. And um, interestingly, the comments from pre-lockdown, um, our active travel implementation plan covered off between 88 and 91 percent of the public comments were covered off within the plan from the local authorities. So one of the things within South Yorkshire that's been really pleasing is that everybody seems to want to head in the same direction. Um, which is obviously what you want. You want that appetite, you want that bold, um, and you want that um, ambitious um, network to appear, and you want everybody to be uh, wanting to use it as well, because it's not just about what the authorities think, it's about the people out there wanting to have that infrastructure in their region. Brilliant, thanks very much. I've got a question, but we'll hold it for later. This one's from Andrew Golding. Uh, I think it's pretty much the theme of the day, really. What's the biggest thing employees can do to help their employees cycle to work? So I will pause that and then I'll bring it I'll bring us back to it. I'm very mindful that uh, what you've witnessed is uh, new demographics taking up cycling uh, and cycle lanes are part of the, the part of the solution, but obviously assisting those people as well. Um, but uh, Paul, this is that's nice. Um, we, yeah. Before the pandemic, we knew that 66% of women um, were uh, who didn't cycle so highlighted safety. So it's one of the things that's coming out with new demographics of people coming into cycling and could potentially cycling to work, and that those fears have to be addressed. Brilliant. Okay, um, and uh, that's a lovely segue into introducing Paul. Uh, so Paul has been doing this for multiple years in, in Holland and has uh, uh, probably understood and overcome so many of these barriers uh, in businesses. So uh, I will pass on to, to Paul. Thank you, Sarah. Paul, welcome. Um, so um, this is your day job, uh, talking to businesses, helping them overcome barriers. Um, but you know, what, what um, tell us the experience of how you actively go out and, and help em employers. Um, but also I think, you know, I want to debunk a little bit of a myth. Uh, you know, uh, surely it's perfect in Holland. Surely F1 cycles and uh, there's no capacity. But tell me what the real story is. <laughs> um, I think we have 22 million bikes in the Netherlands and uh, 17 million people. So uh, everyone is having a bike. But uh, in my, uh, uh, how do you call it, garage is, uh, I have, I think, eight bikes. So a lot of people don't have bikes as well. Mm. Um, but um, I work for 3PM and 3PM is uh, uh, a consultancy firm and we work in the field of sustainable mobility and we work for uh, uh, 300 small and large companies, for example, Heineken, CBRE, Deloitte, IBM, and to help them change their uh, mobility policy uh, to new standards. So we make them more sustainable and the outcome is always more active mobility and less pollution. And we do this also in congested areas. Like Sarah mentioned in Sheffield, we do this uh, in uh, the metropolitan uh, area in Amsterdam and uh, The Hague. And uh, we help local and regional governments um, with reducing car traffic. Uh, there's a lot of pollution and, and congestion, so there are big issues. And uh, what the national government does is they fund a behavior program in, uh, in Amsterdam. And what we did, we built a network of 250 companies and uh, we gave them advice how to change their mobility policy. And what we did, we achieved a reduction of 10,000 cars during rush hour in the morning. And, and what I said, you can see this is a behavior ch a campaign, but what we do is we, um, companies, all, all of the 250 companies can get 40 hours of free advice and it's funded by the national gov government. So uh, it's it's the care to start with improving mobility policy and uh, what they actually otherwise won't do. Uh, so it is an accelerator and uh, what the national government funds 
and it 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 won't help to always build new roads. Uh, you have to do something about the behavior of of the commuters. And our approach and what we do is um, we make an analysis and uh, with our tool, we calculate the potential. So uh, then we can see what kind of new measures we can implement. Uh, if you look at the uh, model split at the moment, 66% travels by car, 12% um, goes by public transport and 22% is uh, going by bike. And in our benchmark with 300 companies, we see that um, the potential is that 46% can go uh, can go cycling. So there lies a huge potential as well. Um, and the next step in our approach is that we uh, check the rules, regulations and allowances. Um, it's it's some, some companies never updated their, uh, how do you say that, um, allowances or measures and policy. Um, so there's a lot to win uh, uh, over there as well. For example, in the Netherlands, you can give 19 cents tax-free to everyone who commutes um, but in the old situation it was from 10 kilometers on um, but companies never updated that so uh, you can you can uh, also earn money with cycling to work uh, if you say 19 cents you live five kilometers away that means you save two euros uh, a day on your return trip that's 40 euros a month and uh, 500 euros uh, uh, a year so you can buy yourself a decent bike. And what we advise as well in, in one of the messages, of course, a bicycle plan. And um, yeah, the main reason that companies or businesses will start with uh, updating their mobility policy is, uh, of course, parking costs, for example, or high parking costs. And um, they want to do something about the carbon dioxide or, uh, or the NOx uh, emissions uh, so to become more sustainable. And um, yeah, another one is, of course, that you can uh, uh, do something about the uh, vitality of uh, of your employees when they cycle to work. Um, and what we say, we, it's not al always one measure. Uh, it's always a combination of uh, measures that's successful. Uh, and what yeah, what I just mentioned above, the, how we work is that, of course, you start with your uh, uh, little inquiry or uh, analyze how your people are traveling to work. Uh, you do a little inquiry, what withholds people from uh, traveling to work. Then you check your rules and your regulations, your, your, you can check your uh, financial benefits for cyclists. Uh, you can, you can uh, update that. Um, the facilities is very important. Um, do you have a shower or uh, dressing rooms, uh, men and women divided? Um, uh, yeah, that kind of stuff. And the last one is always uh, communicate. It's, uh, you always have to communicate and lead by example as well. And for, uh, that management goes to uh, work with their bikes as well. And for example, in the Netherlands, our prime minister is uh, cycling to work uh, almost every day, if he can. Yeah. So I was going to ask you, you know, what surprised you when you've gone to see businesses? I mean, um, as you say, sometimes it's the easy things like just having a role model in the business, you know, the, the, the CEO or or whatever to do that um yeah so what's uh obviously, obviously not what the, what the major barriers are they're probably similar to over here but yeah what's yeah. um what's an easy win for a business do you think um i think if you give people a, a financial benefit so uh, uh, it's, it's a carrot and stick approach i say um you pay the the benefits for the cyclist you 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 take it from the for the people who drive by car um and yeah there are a lot of barriers of course um people say uh, uh, the distance uh, it's always raining yeah? uh, today it is but uh, it's only seven percent of the time it's raining uh, when you're on your bike and um, also one of the barriers is uh, unsafe roads um, but yeah and natural barriers of course when there's a river or a, a slope in your uh, in your commute but um yeah, what, what, what we, we have um, uh, a distance of seven and a half kilometers, kilometers, we say you can use your city bike and to 15 kilometers is the e-bike. And now with the speed pedelec, it's even uh, 22 and a half uh, kilometers. And are you so, seeing the growth yeah. of the speed pedelec market and the e-bike market? We know we can see figures in Holland and 
um, you know, and, and Belgium, you know, cycling cultures of the e-bike sales are, are going through the roof. What's the, yeah. has that been a game changer? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, first, uh, the e-bike the e was a bit for the elderly people, but now we're even uh, kids who drive to school are on the e-bike. And um, yeah, also commuters speed pedaling is, uh, is, uh, is hip. And yeah, um, yeah and um, I think we have uh, uh, almost 40, 50% is on our sales, our bike sales are e-bikes. And we had an increase in the speed pedelecs of 60% since uh, 2018, I believe. So that's uh, becoming one of the models you can uh, use for your commute. Great. And you mentioned right at the beginning of the conversation you know, that you've built up a network of 250 businesses within your region. Are you using yeah. those to learn from each other and yeah. compete with each other and to, to be the best employer they can be? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's just just with with uh, road road racing, uh, you have a peloton, and um, uh, you have some people who are very uh, well. They 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 have the the newest and the 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 the, the hippest and hardest uh, policy for their employees. But uh, there's also a group that uh, yeah that stays behind. But with um, yeah with with uh, with the, uh, the top twenty five, I think it's ten percent. We uh, we have some learnings and they uh, spread throughout the network, of course. Yeah, yeah. And I believe you've got the cycle friendly accreditation scheme in in Holland as well. So businesses that do well can can get a badge to to, to shout. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We have that. yeah. So on, on that, thanks very much, uh, Paul. It's been really useful. I'm going to pass over to Jane because Jane uh, has one of those badges uh, on the business that she works in. Um, so that's not another nice segue there. So welcome, Jane. Welcome. <laughs> Hello. Um, Hello. Yeah, so do you want to just tell, tell everyone a little bit about your journey? Um, as you say, you're an enabler. Um, yeah, you, you know, you've made this happen. Uh, so tell us a bit about where you were, what the problems were, and then you know, how you solved them uh, and where you are now. Certainly I will. And uh, personally, I'd love to see all businesses um, applying for cycle friendly status because I think it is something that tells your staff that you really want them to cycle and that you're there to support them with their journey. Um, I, I, I started really back 2014-15 before Cycle Friendly accreditation was in place. Back in 2014-15, Swansea University changed from just a, a single campus to a dual campus. And the issues we had back then was there were six miles between the two campuses and they were in two different local authority areas as well. And the other things we had on top of that were things like um, counters on the gate of the, of the New Bay campus as part of planning, which said that every single traffic movement going into that campus would be um, counted. And if we went over that number, we'd have to pay per car uh, penalty to the local authority, planning authority, which that's a brilliant way of, of reducing the number of vehicles because the employer has got a reason to do that. So the first thing we did was um, obviously we, we looked at how we could improve the active travel um, and the uh, public transport travel and arrangements for, for staff and students move into that campus. And one of the things we made sure of was that the infrastructure supported uh, cyclists and those that use public transport and of lower car use. So when we went for our, our accreditation, the reason I went for it was because since 2014-15, I've seen so much work being done to promote cycling. Uh, we've got things like uh, a cycle forum, an active cycle forum, which is a cycle user group. And it's not your road cyclists. It's not the ones that, that go on the long cycle as uh, cycles. This is a group of people who want to commute to work and they want to tell you what they want. So we opened it up to anyone that wanted to join the group and it, it, it sort of meets bi-monthly. Um, and they were telling us what they wanted as cyclists to enable them to, to cycle to work. So we've done things like that. And one of them actually brought to the group and said, I noticed that Queen's, uh, Queen's in, in Belfast has got this, this accreditation. Um, I don't know why we haven't got it, because we do just as much as they do, which is great. And this came from a student 
And what the student actually told me, and we've got about 20,000 students in Swansea University, is that if we were seen as a, as a university that had psycho-friendly accreditation, then students often for their university placements would look at universities and say, I want to go there because they will support me as well with my choice of, of active travel. So I applied for it and I honestly thought that we'd have a much lower, um, you know, like I thought we'd have bronze or something like that. So you have to self audit first of all. So I, I'm a very, you know, I'm, I, I'm not very easy at uh, auditing. I, I sort of gave us a really low mark for everything and thought, oh, we're not going to do very well. But never mind, this will help us to improve our offer to, to our staff and students because we will have to now build upon this. Um, the accreditation was over two days and we got the gold level, which was the highest level, and we were the first employer in Wales to get it. So we were really, really proud of that. But what we've done since is we've built upon that. So, you know, we had to have sat back and thought, oh great, we can put this emblem up on the wall, certificate up on the wall and say, we, we got there, so hey, that's brilliant. We, we've actually put in an extra facilities and we've done a lot of things since that as well. So our journey was really to sort of celebrate what had been done already, but also look at the report that was given to us um, by, by yourselves to say what can we do now to keep our gold standard and actually improve on that as well. Great. Um, I mean, if if, I, if you had your time again, um, uh, I'm just thinking people on the on the line will be um, thinking about contemplating how they get their businesses cycling. Um, it sounds yeah. like you you were you because of the new facilities coming in, you had a bit of a. a, a head start, a desire to change, uh, and obviously you've engaged your employees to be part of the forum. Um, yeah, what would you, if you did it again, what would you what would you do differently or what would you do first to say, actually, that was the best thing I could have done ever? Um, I think we've had some, some, some really good feedback. Um, I think being more vocal and getting things in sooner, because one of the things I was very surprised at is when we were trying to put in measures, um, we we didn't have a lot of the infrastructure that we could have had. We didn't have dry-in facilities, for instance. Singleton campus is, is an older campus and you, everything's got to be put in uh, retrospectively. So we had no dry-in facilities. Um, we, you know, there are things we could have done better. So I think I'd have been vocal earlier on because since um, since the accreditation and since going forward, we've had a dry-in room put in. We've had um, these workstations for cyclists to work on their bike. Uh, again, that was something that was brought to the uh, the cycle forum, student staff cycle forum. Why haven't we got these? They've got them in other countries. And actually, they were the first ones that came to Swansea City, which was amazing. So other people were coming in on campus and saying, like the local authority and bike shops, why haven't we got these in Swansea? You know, which was great. So it was the first. So I think it's really setting up your cycle user group earlier on. So we had a travel plan working group, which was to push the whole sort of sustainable travel agenda as part of writing travel plan. But we didn't have a cycle user group early on enough, I don't think. And did you have any barriers? I mean, it sounds like, um... You know, once you got the badge, it was you know, everyone could see the real benefit and just wanted to get to get better and grow from it. Did you have any barriers from uh, the, the the paymasters, the decision makers at the top that you had to overcome? Uh, barriers, I suppose. You've got to sell active travel because hmm. you know you, and it is money. And I think the barriers are, are going to be there more now than ever before because um, with COVID-19 has, has, has come a lot of issues, especially for universities, we're going to get a lot less money. So I think you've got to build a case. So I don't see them as barriers. I see them as challenges. So I think what you've got to do is you've got to sell the benefit of if we do have extra parking, if we do um, promote other types of transport, it's going to cost us. Whereas you can put a little investment in with with cycling and support staff, and the benefits will you know will pay for themselves. So it's things like one of the things that I'm working on at the moment is to try and um, put a, put a higher limit on our cycle to work scheme. 
um, at the moment is on a thousand pound but obviously there is risk to the employer to 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 sort of heighten that limit so yep. that's something i'm working on at the moment but i can see that there are massive benefits as as you know paul said from from the netherlands um 50 percent or thereabouts of of their people and now buying EV bikes, you know, electric bikes. And um, I can see that as the way forward in Swansea because we've got a lot of hills. Uh, mm. People are cycling from out, out, you know, outside of the area uh, and that would be a massive support to them. And it would enable us to say, well, we'd actually don't need as much parking as we thought we needed. Yeah. Great. Well, we've, we've been hugely impressed by the work you've done You've done there and we know that you you are a, a kind of local champion of of cycling and, and and what it can bring so we'll bring that up in the questions later um okay. thank you jane that's brilliant um no one thing i would uh, say matt sorry mm -hmm. is that the biggest thing that you can do as an employer is communicate well to your staff and tell them what you've got so if you right. don't tell them they will never know but yeah. thank you but it sounds like you've got both ends of the both both ends of the journey there. You've involved them in the in the forum so they can tell you what they want, what you what, what they want, and then you can basically once you've got these facilities to shout about them to, to make sure that people use them. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's your one takeaway from today, uh, folks. Um, thanks, Thank Jane. <laughs> Great. Uh, welcome, uh, Anna Martha. Um, Hello there, and I, so you're, you're you're unique in some ways that you you do this to you you advise other businesses through Royal Hoskoning to, to to change their mobility uh, procedures, but likewise yes. you're also involved in your own companies. Um, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So tell us a bit about your journey, um, not not your particular journey, but yeah, the, the journey of the company to being a cycle friendly employer. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, of course, cycling as has been said before, it's pretty common in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, but it is very important to support sustainable mobility and especially cycling as much as possible for your employees. So I've been working at Royal Haskoning for about two and a half years. And this journey started a bit before that. So um, I think for the past three or four years, we've been trying to improve our own mobility policy, mobility policy because we believe in you know, practice what you preach. Um, so not only do we help our clients to uh, to work su towards sustainable mobility, but we also try to do that ourselves. And one of the main things we do is, of course, support cycling. So there are so many options uh, for companies in the Netherlands to support cycling. Uh, for people who already have a bike, which is many of them, <laughs> um, you can uh, compensate their, their travel expenses for uh, cycling as well as for using a car. Um, like Paul already said, um, you can pay them the same amount of money to use a bike uh, rather than a car. So that's one of the things. Um, also, we have public transport bikes uh, at stations, usually train stations, that people can use when they travel by public transport and then transfer to a, a public transport bike to go elsewhere. And we support that as a company as well. So that's free of charge for employees. Um, and also we have a company bicycle scheme, um, which is quite complicated to explain because it has to do with a lot of tax rules in the Netherlands. So I won't bore you with that. But essentially it means that if you, as an employee, buy a bicycle through your company, then it's cheaper for you. Um, and actually one of the benefits of the COVID-19 epidemic uh, pandemic is that um, because people are traveling less, um, and so uh, we as a company have to pay them less money for travel. We actually have more money available right now to expand that company bicycle scheme. So hopefully we can um, heighten the maximum amount people can spend on a bike. So it's also easier and cheaper for them for, to buy electric bikes, for example. And finally, we also have electric, uh, shared electric bikes available at every office in the Netherlands. Um, so that's what we already do and we're looking into anything that's happening uh, to support cycling even more and i also completely agree with jane that communication is essential <laughs> um, if you don't communicate what you have and what's available then no one will use it so that's also part of the things that we do as a company is to to communicate to our employees and to our colleagues what's happening 
So that's great. Thank you. Our journey so far, <laughs> but it's Thank a work in um, process. Yeah. So for the for the um, for the viewers and listeners, um, we have similar schemes in the UK. Uh, cycles uh, the cycle to work scheme, uh, which um, is facilitated by the company uh, and allows employees to save money uh, through tax deduction on and getting a bike. So that's one of the tools that are available to businesses in the UK, uh, and there are lots of providers uh, out there. Um, yeah, electric bike seems to be the kind of uh, it's been picked up on a couple of uh, a couple of things. That's obviously quite a quite an investment for a business to to, to put in. Um, how did you convince your business to to create electric bikes for for staff? Um, well, I wasn't personally involved. And you mean the shared uh, uh, electric bicycles? Yeah. Yes, I wasn't personally involved in that development because it happened in 2017 and I, I didn't work at uh, Royal Hoskoning BHV that yet. Um, but we really thought that it's essential because for our company, for example, we, we are on the road constantly. We travel a lot. And what happens is that people um, travel to the office in the morning or at least, of course, before we uh, started working from home. Um, and then they have a meeting elsewhere uh, during the day. They use their car again to travel to that meeting, then come back again and then travel home. So every trip that you make by bicycle instead of by car is one less, you know, less pollution, less congestion. So that's why we thought it was it's so important to provide opportunities at the office to travel to other meetings as well. And of course, it's an investment. But then again, we also of course compensate our employees if they travel for business by car as well and if they use the electric bike then they they won't get that compensation so it sort of pays for itself again only it's much more sustainable great brilliant and businesses obviously in the, in the uk can capitalize that expense as well so yeah it's uh i think it would be a great uh a great thing for businesses in the uk to have those electric bikes it really is a, a real enabler um, yes. For everyone, you mentioned um, just lastly uh, when we spoke on the phone the other day. Um, a big part of this is what we've heard today is about building that infrastructure, about creating the facilities for people, engaging people, communicating. Um, some of it was also that kind of ongoing promotion. And you told me something about. Uh, I thought you said the low carb diet, but I, I, no. I then realised <laughs> it was the low car diet. So tell us yes. about that. Yeah. Yes, the low car diet. Well, it's a it's a national challenge. I think they're also trying to broaden it internationally, um, but it's a national challenge for one month in the Netherlands, where several companies try to travel as sustainably as possible. Um, so essentially, everything every time you travel, you try to not travel by yourself in a in a petrol car. So. Um, uh, car sharing is fine, using an electric car is fine, but of course we try to focus on uh, cycling, walking, using public transport. Um, and by challenging people to do this for a month, they really try out a new habit because it takes a, a bit of time to, to adjust to a new habit. But if they've been cycling more often for a month, then they realize, oh, this is actually pretty easy and I can cycle to the office and it only takes me 20 minutes. And if I'm stuck in a traffic jam in the morning by car, it also takes me 20 minutes. So that really helps people to get familiar with uh, using more sustainable travel methods. Um, and that really helped. And what also what I didn't mention during our phone call, but what we did is during that same month, it was in September last year, um, my department went to uh, as a trip to one of the uh, Wadden Isles in the north of our country. And we actually left all our cars uh, on the mainland before we left by, by ferry. And we used only bikes the entire weekend to, to travel around the island. And it was completely fine. Of course, the weather helped, but you know, <laughs> but it was, it was fine and everyone, um, no one actually missed their car as far as I know. Yeah. And so. um, just one final point, which uh, and others may have experience of this as well when we come on to the questions. Um, do you find um, colleagues helping other colleagues out, motivating each other, kind of budding up or you know, riding together? Um, if it's possible, if they take the same routes, then yes. Um, but of course, because cycling is already so embedded in our culture, um, we don't necessarily need buddies to to get cycling almost everyone knows how to cycle almost everyone is, is, is able to cycle um 
it's just that most people don't really don't choose to cycle to work yet and that's what we're trying to change and it really helps to have ambassadors in your company uh, and to to share experiences and to really showcase uh, how easy it is to cycle to work or to work locally instead of at the main office great thank you Anna. um yeah really really useful stuff i'm going to invite everyone uh, everyone else back the full panel back for a few questions and i'm going to invite uh, viewers to obviously send us in any questions uh, in the in the question box uh, on the on the on the right hand side of your screens um yeah um so we've got a few minutes for some questions um so you know with these new audiences um is the, is this new pop up infrastructure going to be enough what else is what else is needed? Uh, I'm mindful we mentioned about new demographics, cycling. What should what should we, we be doing as a country, as, as Cycling UK, as local authorities? I think for Sarah. some people, I think for some people there will um, be a, a need for for some cycling training um, to, to give them the confidence to use the roads. I think one of the things I usually find when I ride with someone who's less confident on the road is the positioning that they choose and um, quite often they'll hug the curb too much and um, they'll not give enough space to parked vehicles um, and they need to have that confidence and understand um, the reason for riding in what we call a primary position and how they can support the driver of the vehicle behind them to make the right choices um, and so often um, people say oh they're in the middle of the road it's you know and there's they're up in arms but actually we're protecting the driver from a mistake that they perhaps can't see further ahead on a bike unless you're a recumbent a bike or a recumbent trike you have a better view of what's coming up ahead as well and so you can preempt things better so Bike training is also crucial for some people to give them that confidence to ride in the right place to to to, to help them also when they're navigating when in situations where they're not going to be on complete segregation. Yeah, great. And 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 cycle training is uh, available again for the for the listeners is available um, from private companies like ourselves, but also through local authorities the bike ability scheme, so that, that people can find uh, confidence training. Um, yeah, and also the that... um, repair side of things is also quite crucial. I know with the government are rolling out the £50 vouchers, um, which is coming through um, Cycle UK, but having that opportunity to um, just check the bike and make sure it's safe for the road. And it won't necessarily be a full service for some people, um, but we know that Dr Bike can do um, things outside offices. It can be a mobile service. And it's something that you can have, you know, on a certain day every month or every couple of weeks so that the, you know, the, the cohort of people that have their bikes know that this is the day and I have a time slot and I can get my bike checked by a professional. And so all of those things that make people feel confident in their machine, not just the way that they ride it on the road, but also the fact that they know how it works. So if they do come across a little bit of a problem, they have some basic understanding of how to fix that, but also um, that, that they're going to get it seen by a professional mm -hmm. on a regular basis as well. Exactly. And, uh, I, agree. I, mean that... Sorry, I agree with Sarah there. Um, we we actually do work with Bikeability to to provide training free for staff and students. And having international students, you can imagine cycling on a different side of the road because we we drive on the different side of the road. Um, is overcoming those obstacles. And what we we did earlier on as well is we have got a ride leadership program which the training is in-house. It's provided by a cycle charity, so they have insurance and everything, first aid, and they take people out on commuter rides. So they put all the rides up, and we've got students and staff trained. We've got about 20 people at the moment. So when people go back to work, that's one thing we really, really want to offer, is to sort of really promote that. Uh, last ride we had, we had 30 people on it, so it was just before lockdown. So the numbers were going up, and now, well, obviously, you know, it's gone down again. And also, if you're uh, going to use e-bikes, then training is helpful as well because the speed is different and people are anxious. But uh, when they do it, it's uh, they find it very nice. Um, we do we did a lot of uh, pilots in the Netherlands with e-bikes and companies, and 50% uh, afterwards says uh, they're going to buy a bike and uh, or go to bike more often, uh, to work more often. Yeah. I would really like to add something else to this as well, uh, if we still have time, um, because my team also works on traffic education and we're also involved with the organization that handles the Dutch uh, driver's license. Um, 
And what we find really important is that it's not only about the cyclists, but also about the other people uh, on the road. So especially drivers. And in the Netherlands, when you take driving lessons, um, the first thing you learn is watch out for cyclists. <laughs> they're, they're vulnerable, they're everywhere. <laughs> Um, and as far as I know, that's not really happening yet in the UK. And of course, if more people are cycling, it's vital that also the, the organization that handles driving uh, lessons in the UK really makes a point of um, teaching everyone who wants to get their driving license that it's, it's essential to watch out for cyclists. And, and well, Sarah also talked about safety, I think, uh, at the beginning, that you know, if you, if you want cyclists to feel safe, uh, they need to know that also uh, drivers in cars are, are watching out for them as well. Yes, that's, I completely agree. That's something that the government did recognise in their safety <clears throat> review a couple of years ago about trying to get uh, cycle training within the, um, the, the driver training. Uh, obviously, the, the flip side of that is a lot of people have already been through the, the driver training over the years and they, will, they won't go through the retest. So I've got, there's a question for Sarah. Uh, and maybe if you've got experience from from Holland as well, um, I'm mindful the roadscapes are going to look quite different over the next few weeks. Um, how are you going to educate drivers um, to to be aware of these new cyclists and not potentially break down any kind of backlash? Well, there's going to be signage up, um, and I think uh, all drivers will need to call upon their driving training, which was perhaps done far too long ago. Um, to, to drive to the conditions. So we know that when it's dry, um, you know, and, and when it's wet, the conditions are different. While well, the conditions are different now, the road looks different. So you need to read the signage and make sure you're aware. You need to slow down. Um, one of the frightening things from lockdown has been the instances of speeding. I think one of um, the Met Police officers referred to a 1,167% th uh, increase in speeding in 20 mile an hour zones. And that was just in one part of London. So that's just frightening to think that people are, are utilizing the roads in that way. So driving to the conditions has to be the right message. And I think it's constantly being talked about on social media, pointing out you know, the, the responsibility to vulnerable road users to, to look out for the fact that there are more pedestrians and that those people need to give each other uh, social distance. So that may mean stepping into the road, being aware that if you're driving along a road with a narrow pavement, uh, a narrow footway, that those pedestrians who are crossing each other will need more space if the cones aren't there just yet. Uh, and it's the, the, the idea that we've been protecting the NHS and building on that um, behaviour of protecting people and protecting each other is going to be so vital uh, and calling upon people to to really take responsibility for, for um, their own actions. Um, one of the things that's been really, really great over here, I, I just live outside Greater Manchester, but Greater Manchester have been talking about transport heroes. And the more people that can give up a space on public transport, who can leave their car behind, um, the easier it will be for everybody because there are some people who have no choice but to drive and or have no choice but to use that public transport. But for the vast majority of people, they could probably make that journey without needing their vehicle. And a single person car journey just takes up so much space that we know our towns and cities don't have. So I think we're all appealing to people to, to take that decision in the same way they considered whether or not their journey was essential during lockdown. It's now about how we utilize our road as we ease lockdown and continue to play our part. Great, thanks for that. Um, I'm mindful of time, so we're going to be wrapping up in just a second. I'm just going to, I'm going to ask you to go around very quickly, and it's uh, on the spot. I know there's no one sim uh, silver bullet for this, um, but you know, if, if um, you, you've got an audience of businesses that are, are kind of ready and willing to, to do this, um, what would be the, the first thing you ask these people to do this afternoon to start their journey uh, into becoming a cycle-friendly employer? Anna? I would uh, recommend that they try to know their employees. So um, uh, send out a short questionnaire on how you can help everyone and really use that re those results. Because also if your employees feel heard about what they want, what they need, uh, then it will be so much easier for them to transition towards cycling. Right, Jane. I would agree, ask the questions, set up a cycle forum, run a survey, ask people what the barriers are to cycling and then be seen to be doing something about it. And after you've done that, tell people you've done it. So you say, you said, we listened. And that's very, very important. Great, thank you, Jane. And Paul? 
Yeah, what we mentioned here is uh, communication. That's uh, the most important. And uh, start a little campaign uh, when you know uh, who are your potential cyclists. And also um, communicate about the facilities because that uh, takes away barriers. That's uh, that's what we see. Right. And and Sarah mentioned that she said mentioned about the cycles, uh, the cycling to work uh, voucher scheme um, and activities. Um, I think you know it's it's being aware. I'm talking to the businesses now. It's being aware of what services are already out there for you. As you say, there are cycle training either within workplaces or with uh, with local authorities. There's a range of services that we obviously offer and can uh, give away for free. And there's support that we're doing through the big bike revival at the moment with pop up uh, bike lanes. Uh, yeah, so we will be publishing lots of information about how businesses can um, they don't have to take on the burden themselves. There's, at this moment, there's lots of opportunities. To do so and we've also got a map on our website where local infrastructure is popping up as well so people can use that as a journey planner great so uh 12 so sorry, sorry, sorry i would sorry. also encourage local uh, businesses to engage with their local authority and explain what they need because quite often we talk um, with our own maps to people and in residents but businesses also need to explain what they need collectively and um, to support their employees because it may be different from business to business and where businesses are in different locations. So I'd highly recommend that businesses engage with the people who have um, got this on their radar and are implementing uh, different uh, levels of infrastructure so that they can get their voice heard because the more people we can build into and become a stakeholder for uh, championing this cause, that the quicker it will happen and the more likely it is that people get what they want. Great, okay. And well, that's a lovely, lovely point to, to finish on, which is basically the answer is in your grasp. Uh, businesses, uh, you've got the you've got the toolkit. You've heard what the uh, uh, the method is, and uh, yeah, if you shout loud enough, the local authority want to engage and want to provide you with the services and the facilities that are, will get your people to cycle to work. So yeah, um, rattle through. Thank you all for your time, uh, giving up your time today. Uh, it's been uh, really positive, um, and we'll be publishing this uh, as a video for people to to watch again. Um, thanks to the Dutch Embassy in Brekia for your support on the surveys. Thank you for our, obviously the, the viewers for watching and uh, tuning in and sending in lots of questions. Um, we'll try and transfer some of these questions onto our social media to, to pick up the themes in the next in, over the next few days. Um, yeah, we're here to help. Uh, you know, we're, we're here to, to share the uh, the love uh, and the experience of others. So uh, yeah, tune into website and see what's going on. Good. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your time. Okay. Thank you. All right. right.